Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary General of the Bled Strategic Forum, Mr. Peter Girk. Dear Excellencies, Presidents, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 18th edition of the BLED Strategic Forum, and thank you to Giga and Naomi for this powerful performance. You know that feeling uh, when you sit at home, you watch news about catastrophes, disasters happening all over this world, and you are thinking to yourself, nope, it's not going to happen to us. We are safe. We are secure. But it did happen. It does happen, and it will. This year, natural disaster, a catastrophe, hit Slovenia. Next time, it will happen somewhere else. Probably it's already happening as we are speaking. We live in times of polycrisis, in times of insecurity. Climate change, COVID, Russian aggression on Ukraine, food security, energy security, cyber security, the list of global challenges and problems is very long and I would say brutal. Our sense of security is shattered into million pieces. But we know all that. The question is how we are going to build these pieces back and how we are going to build them back better. This is why we are here today, to discuss, to reflect, to propose ways in which our citizens will wake up tomorrow with a sense of hope and trust into possible solutions. And this is the mission of BLED Strategic Forum, a global platform of diversity and inclusivity committed to generating ideas and exchanging views on contemporary society and its future. How do we start working towards this common good? This question has many layers. Global affairs are, and uh, I think some of you know this much better than me, a complicated and non-altruistic affair. But there are principles, there are values, which should be our driving light. Human rights, democracy, transparency, sustainability, and solidarity. In these past weeks, we have seen a lot of solidarity in Slovenia. And we are humbly grateful to all who extended their help in times of need. On this note, allow me to conclude my brief remarks with sincerely thanking everybody who came here today. It's our honor to host you. Thank you also for the show of solidarity with the citizens of Slovenia, many of whom have lost everything. Lastly, Know this, what we are seeing today could happen without our faithful partners who every year put in practice notions of common good and social responsibility. Thank you. Before I invite our host, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia, Ms. Tania Fajon, let me wrap up this short introduction with my deepest thanks to the BSF team, which every year remind me that we should never underestimate the power, energy, perspective, and wisdom of young people, and I would say also those who are young at heart. Thank you very much. Okay, and now it's time to start working towards the common good. Please, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Thank you to your team. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, good afternoon. Preparing a speech about solidarity, the underpinning theme of this year's Blade Strategic Forum is not a difficult task at a time when we are under the impression of the recent floods in Slovenia, the biggest natural disaster in Slovenia's recent history. At the outset, I wish to express my deepest gratitude to all individuals 
and institutions in Slovenia and abroad who helped our country and our people in these very difficult moments. You are all our heroes. And the show solidarity with the people whose homes were flooded, belongings destroyed, factories, farmland and crops ruined, we felt it was inevitable to adjust the program of this forum. Under the slogan BSF stands in solidarity, we are giving every participant of this year's Blade Strategic Forum an opportunity to help those affected by the floods. And your kind gesture will be very much appreciated. At the same time, we understand that it is equally important to proceed with a Blade Strategic Forum so that we can discuss, that we can brainstorm and seek possible solutions to some of the most pertinent global problems affecting us all. The Blade Strategic Forum is of particular significance for all Slovenian politicians and diplomats who will engage in discussions and actions aimed at strengthening international peace and security during Slovenia's tenure in the UN Security Council in the 2024-2025 period. Since we perfectly understand that cooperation and solidarity lead to overall betterment, Slovenia will remain committed to its UN Security Council campaign slogan, Building Trust, Securing the Future. No global challenge today can be properly addressed with global action. And no global action can be prepared and carried out without solidarity and compromise. With the war in Ukraine and other armed conflicts around the globe, global food and energy supply disruptions, and poverty in the COVID-19 pandemic, cybersecurity, the world calls for our joint action. And rather than making us fall into defectism about the problems looming on the horizon, we must act now. If do not start solving problems urgently, our generation and the generations to come will collectively pay a huge price. This world will change dramatically and uncontrolled fashion, also through natural disasters and armed conflicts. It is our duty to ensure that such scenarios be avoided. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand today on this podium not only as a Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of European and Foreign Affairs, but also as a Social Democrat fully committed to what is called enlightened solidarity, based on the understanding that solidarity is not only a moral and human imperative, but also our investment for the common benefit. In my capacities, I envision a just global system where poverty is eradicated, where income balance and gender balance are the norm, where the world successfully combats climate change and implements transition to green energy sources, where we promote human rights, and so on. And equally important are the rule of law, media freedom, and honoring international commitments and principles such as respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, as well as the peaceful resolution of conflicts. To me, global inequality is a particular concern today in conflict with my political and personal view that all people should have equal opportunities. According to the World Inequality Report 2022, the richest 10 percentage of the global population currently takes 52 percentage of the global income and owes 76 percentage of the world's wealth. Here one should bear in mind a conclusion of the report, the inequality is a political choice, not inevitability. And the biggest political obstacle to global solidarity and security in the future is populism, a political method that includes distorting and faking facts, a political method that, among others, purposely creates tensions within our societies and internationally for preculated political gains. A political method that represents a challenge to science and common sense, as well as to our societies. 
By way of illustration, imagine how difficult it is to fight climate change if it doesn't exist, as some populists wrongly and deliberately claim, or how difficult it is to integrate legal migrants if populists automatically consider them a threat to their traditional lifestyle as an intruders in their homes, and also what damage artificial intelligence can do if used by wrong hands. Therefore, the least we can do to ensure stability and solidarity is to forge a strong international coalition, supporting international organizations and institutions. It is equally important to regulate the fight against disinformation and the fake news, and thus take away the critical tool for the populists. We must also properly regulate the artificial intelligence. And without addressing those phenomena, solidarity-based actions, and even worse, the entire concept of solidarity are seriously <laughs> hampered, and consequently, the world may slide into chaos. And ladies and gentlemen, in its essence, international solidarity is as strong as multilateralism, and vice versa. In fact, the strengthening of international solidarity and security also, if not mostly, depends on effective multilateral system. That is why we must collectively and wholeheartedly support the implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are an embodiment of cooperation and represent at the same time an indispensable stabilization instrument. Urgent actions are necessary to implement the goals of no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, and so on. The times are unfortunately less than ideal for implementation of these noble sustainable development goals, which are often sidelined due to other challenges. And today we probably live in the most dynamic period since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, in a period of rapid changes. Um, the war in Ukraine accelerated polarization. China and United States have been competing to prevail politically and economically in Indo-Pacific and Africa. And the UN and US have been trying to adjust to these new realities, including by building and expanding a global networks of partnerships. There are two main, or at least two main, priorities for Slovenia. First, to stop the war in Ukraine. And second, to use the momentum and enlarge the European Union to the Western Balkans. As we speak about the membership of the Eastern European neighborhood, countries to the EU. Value-based approach can help us significantly in this respect. And regardless of the changing power relations, we must conduct well-managed reforms of international institutions. In fact, discussions about the reform of UN Security Council have been ongoing, probably for too long. My African colleagues have been repeatedly stressing a valid argument that Africa should have a permanent seat in the Security Council, since some 70 percentage of the Africa agenda is being discussed in the Security Council. Indeed, it seems illogical and this should be amended. And rebalancing of the international financial system, what we know as the Breton Woods arrangement, is also necessary to enable to developing countries to finance development reforms with sustainable costs. The UN Secretary General has already spoken publicly about this. And despite the evident deficiencies of the existing multilateral system and existing tensions in the international community, I remain optimistic. There is simply no alternative to multilateral global cooperation. Last year, I talked to around 150 colleagues from all continents and they all support in strong multilateral institutions and cooperation. I'm very proud of the fact that Slovenia 
received such high international recognition by the UN Security Council vote back in June. And time is not on the side of humanity, not only with regard to matters such as environment protection, but also with regard to many other global challenges. This notion should only motivate us to act immediately and decisively. And ladies and gentlemen, according to the armed conflict survey, in last year there are 33 active conflicts in the world. But we speak above all about Ukraine due to the impact of this conflict on the world order. We support Ukraine and show solidarity with this country because we would like to see peace restored on our continent as soon as possible. We would like to see Ukraine having a fair chance of finalizing a lasting and just peace. And in addition, we would like to see peace turning into a different kind of solidarity to collaborate on the reconstruction of Ukraine and finally to renew the security architecture in Europe that will guarantee a lasting peace in this part of the world. And overall, Europeans should feel lucky to live in prosperity, to live on the continent with the smallest differences among states, to live in the EU community, which implements solidarity to regional and structural funds and other mechanisms. These instruments have narrowed income and development gaps between Eastern and Western Europe since the reunification of the continent. Indeed, we are the lucky part of the world. And I was saddened because of the floods in our country, but also very proud to be a Slovenian and a European because of solidarity. And I must say that I am satisfied to be a European citizen for yet another reason, the EU is the biggest donor of international aid, providing more than 50 billion euros per year to so-called third countries. This is an enormous contribution to fighting poverty and encouraging development. And it is our collective contribution to international stability through solidarity. Finally, I would like to end my maybe longer opening remarks with an invitation to all of you to show solidarity with the organizers and other participants by joining in the discussions and arguing your positions with eagerness and candor. As we speak, again, we are having heavy rains in Slovenia and our people fear the worst again. I cannot leave the podium without thanking profoundly Secretary General Peter Gerk and his team for putting together the most substantial and the most up-to-date Blitz Strategic Forum by now. And I look forward to participating in search for global solidarity to unlock the solutions for our common future in peace with nature and ourselves. By way of conclusion, let me again recall that you can donate to those affected by the floods in Slovenia. I sincerely thank you all for your attention, understanding, and solidarity, and wish you all many good ideas, inspiration, numerous new friendship, and a memorable or unforgettable stay in Slovenia. Thank you. Robert Golomb. Spoštovani predsednik Evropskega sveta, Charles Michel, dragi Charles. Spoštovane gostje in gosti, cenjeni, dobrodošli na Blejskem forulu, dobrodošli v Sloveniji. Dear Charles, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to BLED's Strategic Forum, welcome to Slovenia. This month, on August the 3rd, Slovenia was hit by the most devastating floods ever registered in our history. Within a matter of, an hour, of hours, 10,000 of homeowners lost their homes. 
families lost everything. Not just material things, they lost their memoirs. They lost everything that was precious to them. Hundreds of bridges were wiped away. More hun hundreds of kilometers of roads wiped away. But the world didn't stop, and we must not stop. And this is why I'm so grateful for the, to the organizers of this forum that they adapted. They adapted the forum not just to the word solidarity, but to the spirit of solidarity. My deepest gratitude, because this is how we show what solidarity is all about. Because solidarity is not just what we witness on the ground when people help each other, when the neighbors help their neighbors, friends help their friends, family members help their family. It's also about bigger picture. Because we were not alone. Immediately next day, we were able to secure relief from the EU. We were able to secure relief offered voluntarily from our neighboring countries within the region. Even NATO got active. Everyone understood that we are facing unprecedented catastrophe, that in the name of solidarity, all of the international community needs to come to our help. And that was of enormous, enormous value to our citizens, because they knew that we are not alone. And that is really the message of solidarity. When the times are harder, you need to know you will not be left alone. Then everything is much easier. In these dire times, I need to pinpoint one particular nation, which is Ukraine, that also helped. The country which is in a, so much pain under brutal aggression sent their best engineering teams with heavy mechanized equipment. To, and they are still here, helping our people to rebuild their community. I would also like to express my gratitude to all of you, all of those who already helped, some of you who already donated, and others perhaps that will contribute in the following hours. Because it's by showing this solidarity is that we show that cooperation on international level is really what makes the world better. And I think this is one message we shall never forget, not just when we are in dire times, because you never know when things may get difficult for you. And as Peter Gerg was saying, in Europe sometime, or most of the time, we live under the impression that bad things do not happen around here. They happen far away, far abroad. Well, not anymore. Extreme weather that we are facing is, of course, of localized. It's a localized phenomenon, but it happens because of global development. And yes, climate change is not something that any of us can escape. It is here. It is happening. We can see its impact practically every year. It's hardly predictable, if not unpredictable. The only predictable thing about climate change is that it's not going to get any better by itself. But this is a message that we shall never forget. It is hard because on the paper, especially if I forget about those naysayers, but I will just exclude them from the picture because I'm pretty sure there is no one, no naysayer in here. So on the paper, everything is clear. We just need to undertake green transition. We just need to make it just for the undeveloped countries, and everything will fall in the right place. But unfortunately, I think we already missed the opportunity to do it as simple as that. Perhaps 30 years ago, that was the case. Not anymore. Right now, we live in a world where we need to face the consequences as well. So it's not enough to clean our energy sources. It's not enough to switch on electric cars. It's not enough to eat less or even perhaps no meat. And we will have to do all of these things in the next years. 
We will have to change our consumption patterns, our consumer behavior, all of it. And still, it's not going to be enough, especially not for our children. And we owe it to them that we do all of those things. But still, we need to put in place mechanisms how to adapt to the catastrophes as the one that hit Slovenia three weeks ago, because they will happen. And we can only address this at the international level. No nation, especially not single small nations, can face it alone. Even big nations, they cannot face it alone. And this is one message that we will definitely bring on the table during our residency in the UN Security Council. We want to put climate agenda at the top of the agendas. That is what is going to be our primary agenda. And one reason why I think we may be successful, not because of the catastrophe that we, we faced three weeks ago, because I believe that uh, being from a small, small country with no specific particular interest, no agenda of our own, that makes us a very honest broker, if we want to be, if we are brave enough to undertake that role. And yes, I can tell you right now, we are brave enough. That's the reason why we made a candidacy. We want to be honest broker. We want to be sincere, perhaps addressing the issues that bigger nations are somehow neglecting due to their own national agendas. Well, we don't have any. They ma that makes us perfect to tackle the most difficult problems. And yes, the other one is definitely be how to bring peace to Ukraine. It is practically impossible at this time, perhaps. But we will invest all of our knowledge, all of our time, to this one particular goal. Whether we're going to be successful or not, no one can tell. But will we try? Yes, we will. Because this is the, most, the single most important immediate topic on the table of United Nations. And that's the only place where this war can end, at the table in United Nations. And we will do everything we can to bring it forth. Finally, I'm really glad to have all of you, my dear colleagues from the Western Balkans here. Uh, I'm glad that you all got here. Nobody is missing. Just this in itself. It's a huge success, but it doesn't stop here. Because the message that I want to impart, and I th I'm pretty sure that Charles will do it in a much even more concrete way, but the message that I want to impart is that the momentum is changing. Due to Russian aggression on Ukraine, the stance of European Union member states regarding the enlargement of European Union got totally new perspective. Things are changing rapidly. In the next 12 months, I'm pretty sure that the enlargement process will get not just traction, but will get a new outlook. And I urge all of you to not be left behind. I urge all of you to continue pressing on with the reforms, but also to be aware of what's going on regarding the changes within the European Union itself. We all know that we will have to reform our processes within the European Union. And as I, told, and as I say, this reform, these reforms either happen within the next 12 months or they may not happen for a very long time. This is an occasion that shall not be overlooked. So Slovenia will be, remain strong supporter for your admission and Slovenia will continue to do as, all those things that are necessary within European Council as well, but also together with the dialogue with the co Commission to make it possible for you to become a member of our European family, to put you where you belong. And I think this is the last message that I wanted to impart. And as I said, none of these challenges that I addressed are going to be easy to meet, none. We will have to work hard. We will use tons of money, especially for the floods relief and the reconstruction. It will take a lot of time. 
but we need to find both courage and wisdom. And we will, in order to show that, yes, we can. We can build a better world, a world based on solidarity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the European Council, Mr. Charles Michel. Dear President, dear Prime Minister Robert Gallup, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, yesterday, I visited a few areas hit by the recent floods, and it was truly shocking. But I also witnessed the remarkable courage of the Slovenian people, and I've also been impressed by the focus and determination of the Slovenian authorities and by the leadership of the Prime Minister Robert Golop. And you are right, dear Prime Minister, you are not alone. Slovenia is not alone. The EU is also lending a strong supportive hand along with our member states, along with our partners like Ukraine and the Western Balkans. And it made the title of this year's forum, Solidarity for Global Security, even more resonant. Solidarity. Solidarity, this is what we enforce the fabric of a community. Solidarity, this is what gives us the power to stand strong against life's greatest challenges. And this same solidarity is at the very heart of European integration. It makes our European Union stronger. So you won't be surprised that today I want to talk about solidarity. Today, I want to talk about enlargement. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, we are facing unprecedented and interconnected crises. And this summer's natural disasters in Greece, in Slovenia, and across the globe are urgent reminders why we need to manage our transition to climate neutrality. The war in Europe on Ukrainian soil has shown that peace and democracy cannot be taken for granted. And this war is not just devastating Ukraine. This war has a profound impact on the future of our continent, has a profound impact on global security. COVID-19 also taught us some hard lessons. Global health security is not a given, even in developed countries. And faced with these challenges, the EU has shown we are able to act boldly and decisively when needed. We were the first in the world to decide to make our continent climate neutral by 2050. And when faced with the first global pandemic in a century, we stood together to agree very quickly on a massive recovery plan. And ladies and gentlemen, when Russian forces decided to invade Ukraine, the Kremlin and probably others expected a weak response, a divided Europe. They got the opposite. In just a few hours, on February 24th, a meeting I will never forget in the European Council in Brussels, we responded with massive sanctions against Russia, massive support for Ukraine, and deliveries of weapons and ammunition to Ukraine. A different EU revealed itself on that day, fast, determined, united and more decisive. And ladies and gentlemen, when the new Putin decided to launch an energy missile at us, we responded with a powerful energy shield, a true energy system, energy defense system, by diversifying our energy sources and breaking our over-dependence on Russian fossil fuels. We have also we energized our alliances with our strategic partners. Solidarity. Solidarity was our guiding light for all these decisive decisions and actions. But, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, in today's increasingly complex world, we as Europeans, we have crucial choices to make. Are we content 
with a European Union that only manages crisis? Or do we want to be a leading global actor that shapes the future? Are we resigned to a bipolar confrontational world? Or do we want to help build a multipolar world anchored in global cooperation? We have already become more influential. For instance, on climate neutrality, we became more assertive by confronting Russia's aggression, or even more realistic by working with partners not fully aligned with our values. We are also working hard to help remodel the global approach to development. It's essential to making the world safer and more prosperous. And we want to be more influential, to shape a better world, and we want to be stronger, to be a stronger ally. And that's why we are building our strategic autonomy brick by brick. Ladies and gentlemen, to be stronger, to be safer, the EU needs to reinforce our bonds and become more powerful. And that's why it is now time to tackle the challenge of enlargement, both for us in the EU and for our future member states. And yes, I believe this is how we should now call the countries with confirmed EU perspective, future member states. It's time to get rid of the ambiguities. It's time to face the challenges with clarity and with honesty. The road to the EU for the Western Balkans began more than 20 years ago, a region at the heart of Europe, surrounded by the EU. It was also a region emerging from conflict after the breakup of Yugoslavia. And the Thessaloniki Summit in 2003 confirmed the European perspective of the Western Balkans. But the slow pace of this EU journey has disappointed many, both in the region and in the EU. And I agree with Chancellor Olaf Scholz when he says Europe must keep its promises. As we speak, the people of Ukraine are heroically defending their country, their homeland, their future. And the Kremlin is not only attacking a free and sovereign neighbor, the Kremlin is attacking all that we believe in, freedom, democracy, prosperity, and the spirit of cooperation and mutual respect. So, in June last year, we decided to grant the candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova, and the same status awaits Georgia when they complete the necessary steps. So, no, enlargement is no longer a dream. It's time to move forward. There is still a lot of work to do. It will be difficult. It will be complex, sometimes painful for the future member states and for the EU. But let's be clear. If we want to be credible, I believe, we must talk about timing. We must talk about our homework and have a suggestion. As we prepare the EU's next strategic agenda, we must set ourselves a clear goal. I believe we must be ready on both sides by 2030 to enlarge. <laughs> and, and this means that the EU's next long-term budget will need to include our common goals. This is, I know, ambitious, but this is necessary. It shows that we are serious. It will build momentum. It will give a transformative boost to reforms, and it will generate interest, investment, and better understanding. It will also encourage all of us to work better together. The window of opportunity is open. We need to act on it. And that's why EU leaders will discuss enlargement at our next European Council meetings. We will take a stand on the open of negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova. And I also expect Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia to be back on the table. My dear Western Balkan friends, you have made your aspirations extremely clear. And I want you to succeed so what will it take? First, rule of law. Our union is founded on the fundamental values of human rights and dignity, democracy, and solidarity. And the rule of law ensures 
We can live, we can work, we can create, we can trade fairly in one big area of liberties in full respect for our diversity. In the EU, each citizen, each company must trust that they will be treated fairly wherever they live or do business. And this includes respecting the rights of minorities. Enlargement is and will remain a merit-based process because membership of the union brings both responsibilities and benefits. And to take on the former and reap the latter in a highly competitive environment, you need to be ready. And this means, indeed, to make sure the judiciary can play its independent role in fighting corruption and organized crime. It also means being ready economically, in particular by adopting the EU acquis and standing with us in foreign policy more important today than ever. Third point, addressing bilateral and regional issues. Resolving bilateral conflicts from the past may be more painful than reforms, but it's necessary. And in fact, you are walking the same path as the founding members of our union. There is no cooperation without reconciliation. And I would like to be clear, there is no room for past conflicts within the EU. And your people, especially the young, they want to be inspired by a brighter, fairer, more prosperous future. And joining our union would be splendid proof of a collective success. Ideally, you would all join together. Yet, future member states are at a different stage on their journey to the EU, but we need to make sure that past countries are not imported into the EU and used or even abused to block the accession of their neighbors and future member states. And here, a small idea. One way could be to add a so-called confidence clause in the accession treaties to ensure that countries that just joined cannot block future member states. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, to address all these challenges, the EU is trying to strengthen our support for you, but I know that we need to do more to close the development gap. And first, through progressive and gradual integration into EU policies, so the benefits can be felt more quickly by the population, even before membership. I put forward this idea last year, and the European Council supported it. And the Commission's enlargement package, expected in October, is, I think, a good opportunity to outline the concrete details of this progressive integration. And this could take place in different areas. For instance, the single market. We have ambitious frameworks in place that support the alignment of future member states with the EU acquis, and they can take advantage of existing options such as the energy and transport communities. I propose that we use these frameworks to phase in future member states and to integrate them into specific EU policy areas once conditions are fulfilled. For instance, another idea, a country could participate in a corresponding council formation once they complete the negotiation in the given policy chapter. In the same spirit, we have established the principle of yearly EU Western Balkan summits. And I will convene our next EU Western Balkan summit in December in Brussels, back to back with our European Council meeting. Another area for gradual integration could be security and defense. We could invite interested future member states to more actively participate in some policies or instruments like CFSP missions or the Defense Fund or the European Peace Facility. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU also needs to get ready for enlargement. And I fully agree with uh, what President Macron said. Not reforming on our side before the next enlargement would be a fundamental mistake. And let's be honest, we have sometimes used, maybe we have abused, the lack of progress of future member states to avoid facing our own homework, our own preparedness. We must now take a serious look at the EU's capacity to absorb new members. And I know this idea is sometimes misunderstood as a hidden obstacle to accession. To the contrary, 
It only makes sense for new member states to join a union that's functioning well, that's efficient. It also makes sense for the existing member states if it creates new opportunities. Integrating new members into our union won't be easy. We all know that. It will affect our policies, our programs, and their budgets. It will require political reforms. It will require a lot of political courage. The EU's territory and demography will get bigger, and yet its relative prosperity will not immediately follow. Significant funds will be needed to help countries catch up. And we need to make sure that the EU budget brings European added value for all. The GDP of the future member states is about 50 or 70 percent of the smallest EU economy. And this means there will be net recipients, while several current net recipients will become net contributors. So we need to work on how to manage this complex transition. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU's decision-making process has made a quantum leap in recent years. Yet we can do more to speed up our decision-making. More members will mean more diversity, and we will have to adapt our institutional framework and procedures so an enlarged EU is able to take efficient and timely decisions. And on the very sensitive and very difficult topic of unanimity, I personally believe that completely scrapping unanimity could be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because unity is at the core of the EU's strength. Unity is the best way to make sure decisions are uniformly implemented. And of course, we know there are various ways to get united. For instance, when we decided to activate the peace facility to fund arms delivery to Ukraine, constructive abstention was used to not impede unanimity. And there are different ways to adapt the qualified majority, whether in numbers or when and how we apply it. We know this will be a hard nut to crack. Again, it will be difficult, but there is no way to avoid this debate now. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you my personal conviction, not more than that. The heart of enlargement is, in my opinion, not about processes, screenings, assessments, negotiations, treaties. The heart of enlargement is about the people, about the future of our children, about the fate of Europe. So we need to make sure that we have the hearts of the people with us, the hearts of the people with us. This may be our biggest challenge. This involves explaining the EU. This involves highlighting the benefits and it's a choice of society. It also means moving beyond the lineage of the past to focus on the future. With real political will, we can make both the EU and the future member states ready. Now you have understood, is this the time to be bold? No, this is the time to build our larger European future all together. Thank you.